Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with WDSC, WRPT in Duluth, Minnesota. Today we are chatting with Patra Sebastiadis, Executive Director of the Duluth Library Foundation, who has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. And thank you, Patra, for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. So libraries really loom so large in my own heart. It was mm -hmm. how I learned to read, and I had a lot of difficulty learning to read okay. uh, when I was a child. Talk about the work of the Duluth Library and its foundation. So some people ask me, are libraries even relevant anymore? And I have to say, it's usually people who haven't been in the library for some time and haven't seen libraries changing. What we know is that libraries are um, centers of community, they're centers of lifelong learning, and they're centers where everyone is welcome. And so opportunities for anyone to walk in the door and learn anything, such as you learning to read, uh, such as people applying for work or learning new opportunities. They're still the heart of the community. They're still a place where everyone is welcomed. And they're still places of opportunity um, to make new things possible. What we, what we don't realize, what we don't really, it, it's not that we don't realize it as much as we don't really think about it, is that libraries have three different natures. They have traditionally been a place, a repository for books, yes. a place where books or scrolls before that mm -hmm. were kept so that if you needed to access it, you actually had to go to that physical location. Yes. But there are other natures that are intrinsic to library as well. It's the community building and the communication, mm -hmm. and it's the access to those libraries that's so important. A library is a place where regardless of means, you can gain access to the world, can't you? Absolutely, absolutely. And in fact, for many people, you mentioned technology in there. For many people, the library is the first place where they'll encounter new technology. Libraries evolve as technology evolves. And so for many people, that's where they go for a computer or an e-reader or any number of technologies. If you go to the computer center at our library, you'll see the 22 stations are almost always full. Uh, so yes, libraries are precisely that, places where anyone can thrive, and, uh, and we're pleased to be able to fund that and make those things possible. What's also changed is the role of the librarian. What kind of knowledge are you going to curate? What kind of, how, what kind of a guide are you going to provide? And yes. how do you gain access? How do you give access to people in a way that allows new knowledge to flow through that library, but also in a contextualized way? What we find is that information, the power of information and managing information is at the heart of the library still. <clears throat> so while some may say the internet has all information out there, mm -hmm. why do you even need a library with what it may retain? What we know is that librarians can determine what is good information, right. not such good information. And so they're still managing information. We receive between one and three letters at the library for the reference department, and I'm sure dozens more on phone and email, because people know that the library is still a source that can be trusted in terms of managing information, finding information, or even finding a book that's not available in our city or in our state, and may even be out of the country, that it can be obtained through the library. A library is a neutral ground, isn't it? It yes. isn't really about whether it's, it's uh, Fox or CNN or Google or Facebook or, um, or uh, some organization with an agenda. The agenda of a library is to provide access and to provide, allow people to guide themselves. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And it's wonderful because it's a model of service to other. So the librarians are there not to tell you what you should believe or whom you should listen to in that sense or that agenda, but rather how can we help you find the information that you're or looking for. Or tilt what you have access to, what exactly. you actually see. Talk a little bit about the library sure. on the one hand and, and the foundation's role in supporting its function. Well, so uh, another question I'm often asked is why is it that a public library needs private funding? Aren't we paying for that with our taxes? And of course, that's right, we are. Um, and so the city of Duluth has money in its budget for the library and it pays for the staff and the buildings. It even has a line item for materials, books, subscriptions, other things that the, the community needs. Um, but in that budget, there's no money for programs. So that every library program for everyone from tiny children 
to school-aged children, teens, adults, and seniors, that's all paid for by grants and donations. So, and in addition, we know that the demand for library services and materials exceeds the library budget. So the Library Foundation exists to make it possible to bridge the gap between what the library budget can do and what the community is actually demanding. And that's private funding. It's people who love the library who want to make it fruitful for the community. Talk about some of those programs. Oh, everything from um, story time. We made it possible for the two branches to have their own story time essentials kits, puppets, uh, art materials, and other things so that they could set up their own programs, not having to rely on the main library. Um, School-aged children, teeny weeny robots. We can teach children how to code with robots. That was funded also at the Library Foundation. One of my favorites is the Teen Anime and Manga Club, where teenagers come to the library and they talk about everything from Japanese animation to graphic novels. And then they eat and laugh and play games and they build community. They put down their screens and they're talking with each other and with librarians. And then they come to the library even when the programs aren't going. So they're falling in love with the library. Um, and then we also have programs for adults, everything from making non-toxic materials to clean your homes to summer programs, live concerts, outdoor at the library. So things that build community, things that build learning. Could you talk about how the uh, library continues to serve its traditional base of, of readers who love physical books? Absolutely, I'm one of those as well. I, I will read on a screen if I have to, but I just find the comfort of a book, the smell of the pages, the feel it in my hands mm -hmm. so reassuring. So it does continue to have such books. It also offers e-books and e-readers for those who want to carry less or to have something that can increase the point size of letters. Mm -hmm. But uh, we are full of books and uh, constantly updating what those books are, bringing in not only bestsellers, but things that the community has asked for. So we continue with books, uh, but we continue with all sorts of information, to your point. It really is Whatever the information is, the library will manage it, be that papyrus scrolls in the past or digital today. How do you provide help to people of limited means to ensure that the, uh, the playing field is somewhat more level when it comes to accessing knowledge through your programs and accessing your programs themselves? Are your programs fee-for-service programs? Do, you, do people have to pay um, a bit to, to participate? Um, how do materials work? If you have art materials, how does that work? Right, great questions. In fact, everything the library offers is free, everything. That's its ethos, and that's, that's why you need additional funding. So anyone can come and participate. Sometimes you only have certain materials, only room enough for 24 people, so then people have to pre-register, but there's no fee for that. So you show up and you're provided with whatever you need. Um, it's open to everybody. We have three library locations in mm -hmm. Duluth. And so each of the two branches has different needs than the downtown. And so the, the programming focuses on the needs of that community and the interests of that community as well. Uh, that said, everyone can go to any of the different programs. Um, access is for everyone. Um, the doors are effectively open all the time at the library. That's the feeling of the place. And one of the things that the library recently instituted was a fine-free policy, because what we saw was that people in zip codes of lesser um, resources often were the ones with the biggest fines. And that meant that shame and, uh, and a sense of uh, the idea I can't go back to the library was keeping people away. And what we've seen in the last four months is it's been changing as a result of the fine free policy. Not only have people been returning things that they've been holding on to, but people have started using the library more. And that's a trend across the nation. So I'm, I'm happy to say that we're part of that. Yeah. What does the future hold for the libraries in Duluth? There, there, there are a few things that the Library Foundation has been told that the library is looking to accomplish. And these are things that are leading out uh, in time. One of them is Every Child Ready Duluth. It's a program that has just started. It's to help children be ready for school. And it's something that we're incredibly excited about helping because it's a long-standing problem in Duluth. So Duluth's um, level of poverty is twice the national average. We're at about 20%. So that's a context. Uh, one of the other challenges we have is that when children are 
ready to go to kindergarten, they're tested. And we've found, we found that only 41.8% of them are considered school ready. And so when they get into the school classroom, they're not thriving. And, uh, and the reason that's a problem is because if one out of every two children going into kindergarten isn't doing well, what they're seeing is they're seeing other children raising their hands, knowing to use the cubby and where to hang up their coats. They know how to engage in learning information. They're excited about what it is that they're learning. Those other children watching can say, well, they must be smart. I must be dumb. They must belong at school. I don't belong at school. I don't feel good being here. And the reason we know that matters is because what we see is if children enter kindergarten and they're school ready, the statistics on their lives are dramatically better. Uh, they'll learn how to read on time, more likely. They're more likely to graduate from high school. Uh, as adults, they're more likely to have um, jobs with more income, more likely to be civically engaged, such as voting. Their health outcomes and their children's health outcomes are more likely to be better. So we see that if at this crucial moment they are engaged, children are engaged and ready to enter school, their life outcome is better. And we know that the odds are stacked against children who are not. So why am I telling you all of this? Because the library has recently uh, launched a new endeavor called Every Child Ready Duluth. It's based on the American Library Association's program, Every Child Ready to Read which has many successes. And the idea is if you can engage the parents and caregivers of a child, that child is more likely to be ready. And if you let those parents know that they're their children's best and first teacher and give them the simple tools to help their children, their children are more likely to thrive. And in Duluth, um, that's a challenge that the library is willing to take on. And it's one that was identified the community in the community some years ago. Yeah. The return is just amazing because yes. these are the transformational actions yes. that we can all take. They seem small at the time, yes. but those ripples spread out and they impact people across the community. Patros Avasiatis, thank you so much for sharing the work of the Duluth Library, the Duluth Library Foundation, and thank you so much for your insights. You're welcome. It was a real pleasure. Thank you so much, Mark. Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with WDSC, WRPT, in Duluth, Minnesota. Today we are chatting with Trent Janicic, board chair of the Northland Foundation, who has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. And thank you, Trent, for joining us today. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. So this foundation looms very large in the region, and you have a particular take on how philanthropy ought to function effectively in this area. Talk a little bit about the, the philosophy that led to the founding of the Northland Foundation? So the Northland Foundation has been around for 34 years or so, give or take. Um, it was really born out of the McKnight Foundation, which is a, a larger foundation based out of the Twin Cities. Um, and what they did is they, they started, they felt like there was the opportunity to create regional uh, philanthropic organizations that had greater Minnesota uh, or rural Minnesota um, more at the forefront of what they do and what they're focusing on. And so they created six um, regional uh, initiative foundations, they called them at the time. The Northland Foundation was one of them. Uh, and the goal for, for the, each regional foundation is slightly different, but the same. Um, they, they really want to make sure that our, our region is vibrant, our rural region is vibrant, and that we're investing, like our mission for the Northland Foundation is to invest in the people um, of our communities to grow and have a vibrant, vibrant regional, um, not only economy, but regional community. And so, uh, you know, in short, I think a lot of us at the Northland Foundation are just committed to making our region a little bit better than when we left it. And so, One of the things that I find so fascinating is the idea of the McKnight Foundation being both a, a nationally active mm -hmm. as well as regionally committed. And, and their interpretation of that regional commitment was that uh, grant making and those decisions need to be taken within the region that those grants were going to be distributed. Yeah. Because those people had greater understanding of what those 
uh, of what that re so it was a it was a purposeful decentralization, and they uh, and they also threw off some of their uh, resources so that each of those foundations were set up, um, so that they were strong to do those do those grants. Yeah, exactly. And, and at the Northland Foundation, we have three legs to our stool. Um, we have our grant making program, which, in a, in a way, it mirrors exactly what you said about what McKnight saw in the Initiative Foundations. We work with nonprofits because, in a, on a more local level within our region, because we believe that they know exactly what the needs are. And so we don't come in uh, as an omnipresent organization that thinks they know exactly what, what, what they need to do. We, we really want to listen and facilitate conversation in a region and then have the partners that are most in tune with that local response be the ones that are, that are um, solving some of those, those smaller issues. And so our grant making program, you know, we, we give out about $1.6 million every single year, roughly, give or take. And that money is, is you know, in some cases over the last, you know, 30 or so years, uh, we've given out somewhere in the neighborhood of $36 million or so um, across 5,000 different grants. So when you average it out, it's about $7,000 $7, per grant but we have large scale grants and small scale grants, but those are two organizations, whether it be school districts, it might be other nonprofits, it might be other community organizations, it might be uh, our, our, our friends in the tribal nations that there's five in their service area. So there's a lot of, uh, we, we feel that, we feel strongly about the McKnight Foundation mantra on a local level, just like they did about the initiative. But you've also evolved the model, right? You you also provide capacity building support. Correct. Don't you? Yeah, yeah. So capacity building. One of the one of the other main things that we do is we facilitate conversation. We allow for capacity building within our grant making. We, let's let, yeah. let's define what capacity building is, because what what you're basically trying to do is to work with a nonprofit to define a need that yep. can't be satisfied by a check. Yep. Correct. And, and that could be expertise, it could be knowledge, it could be connection, it could be partnerships. Yeah. And you're helping in, the, in those areas. Yeah, we, we absolutely try to. I mean, some of those, if we, can, if we can allow a nonprofit or groups of nonprofits to get together and develop something that's long-term, more sustainable, that's obviously what the direction we'd like to go. Um, sometimes a check has an endpoint, but we would like to make sure that when we're giving out grant resources or loans that they have a long extended life, that it continues to have, um, have tails on that, on that resource. And that's what capacity building does. You also have a very interesting role within, in terms of supporting businesses yeah. in the region. Could you talk about that? Because that's, again, it's, it's, yeah. it's not quite the traditional, you know, people think about foundations as, as check writing machines. It's, yeah. it, it's not a particularly um, uh, wonderful description, but, yeah. but yeah. people understand that. But this capacity building piece and then this other element is also uh, very important in this region. Yeah, it's also one of the other legs of the stool, so I'm glad you brought it up, so thank you. Um, so one of the unique uh, aspects that the Initiative Foundations have in, in general is that they're, they're able to provide direct loans to businesses. And it's unique that our philanthropic organizations are able to do that. Um, and so we, we do give out over the last, you know, since our, since our inception, um, we've given out somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, somewhere around $67 million of, of loans to businesses. And that's saved or created about 8,200 jobs um, in our region. And so that's really, really impactful. Uh, so one example I'll, I'll give you is um, in 2012, we had a, a major flood in Duluth. And there were a, a few like-minded organizations like the Blandon Foundation and us that got together with other partners to provide capital that was readily available for businesses in a loan format or a grant format as well to get, get uh, to be able to recover from that, that flood and have just in time uh, access to capital that's right there waiting for them. So not only do we partner with other banks and other loan uh, entities, we also work with our philanthropic partners to provide loans to businesses so that they grow, so that they can um, maybe buy equipment as well from the state. So there's a lot of different funding mechanisms that we try to put together to, to help um, people generate jobs potentially, family sustaining wages, and that's really important in our region. What is the difference between a loan uh, and a relationship that is forged with a foundation versus one that is forged with a commercial entity like a bank? 
I think they're one and the same. I think you know banks have are, are really interested in in economic growth, mm -hmm. um, and that economic growth tends to to work uh, if if it's tied to an entrepreneur starting a business in the west end of Duluth, um, whether it's uh, you know Frost River starting starting uh, their work or expanding their work and and starting to create an ecosystem that's in West Duluth. All banks are in on that the same way we're in on that. And so it seems like it's a, it, it creates this vibrancy in a community that isn't, I don't think they're, they're mutually exclusive. I think that they, working together, they create uh, something that can be really, really positive, like what is happening in the West End of Duluth right now. And so I think, I think that they're, they're linked. And, as, and all that, I think that the most important thing with that is that we're developing great relationships with those, those folks and those partners, whether it's a bank or it's another philanthropic organization. You know, we don't have these silos in our, in our region. Um, the, the goal is to work across silos and work and have really great regional partnerships that are, you know, coming together for a common purpose. And that's what I think we're able to, to, to we've been able to do over the last, you know, 34 years. In terms of your board, talk about how your board is constructed, mm -hmm. because you have this very interesting um, uh, purview of different services that you provide. Yeah. So that requires certain expertise and certain oversight. Yeah. There are committees that are involved, as you say, committees of experts uh, who um, are, are overseeing this because banks do require, uh, or organizations that function as a, a bank do require a certain amount of oversight. So how does your board, how is your board constructed? So our board, you know, we have 11 individuals that are on our board, our, our direct bo uh, board of trustees for the Northland Foundation. But there is the TAC, the Technical Advisory Committee, which is more of an advisory committee to Michael's work in the business loans. Um, I, I mentioned two of the legs of our stool. We have a third leg of our stool, which is our, our Kids Plus program. And maybe we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but we try to make sure we align our board of trustees with um, the areas of expertise that we have, right? So if we're interested in childcare, we should probably have somebody that has some sort of background about childcare on our board of trustees. So we're very cognizant of who do we have. You know, right now we just um, we just put out a call, an open call for new trustees, uh, which is something that we've been working to to move towards, where it's open to anybody in the community that's available and interested in participating and being on the Northland Foundation Board of Trustees. So we have applications that we've received, and we we go through and we look at what who do we have on the board. What's their background? What do they do for a living? Um, where do they live? All those types of things. How old are they? You know, I'm one of the younger board members and have been uh, since I came onto the board nine years ago. Um, and so, what what are what's the demographic makeup? Who are we? Where are we from? All of that background goes into this pot um, of the Northland Foundation board. And we're I'm really proud of our board. I love our board uh, dearly. Uh, I think it's been the best professional experience that. I've ever had um, being part of and associated with the Northland Foundation. But we do, we try to align that. And underneath, the, in terms of governance structure, we have a governance committee, just like other organizations. We have a finance committee. Um, and so mainly, obviously, fiduciary responsibility is the most important thing a board does. Second is governance um, and making sure that our, our president, um, Tony Surtich is doing a great job, which he absolutely is. Um, and so, you know, those are the couple main components. Um, and keeping an eye on where we're going, casting our gaze on the horizon and saying, this is where we want to go over the next 20 years. Talk about the Kids Plus initiative. Well, the Kids, Kids Plus initiative is, I have to say, it's, it's magical, all right? Um, you know, one of the things we really try to do at the Northland Foundation is bring external resources to our region um, from other places in the state, maybe nationally. Uh, and that's one of the things that the Kids Plus program does. And Kids Plus is really our educational programming, if you will. Um, and there's a whole suite of programs underneath that Kids Plus heading. Uh, and nationally renowned programs uh, like Age to Age, um, which is intergenerational, getting people in communities that, uh, older people in communities mixed with younger people to maybe work on projects together. And there's some just magic that happens there. Uh, it's our youth leadership program where we get a whole group of people, uh, young people together from the region that come into the Twin Ports in Duluth and they work on like a service project, but there's also professional development and learning that goes in, into that. And that's funded 
primarily through external sponsors that, that believe that it's really important to have our youth engaged on, around some sort of project. Our youth in philanthropy program where um, the Minnesota Power Foundation provides resources as well as one of our former board members, Scott, Scott Martin and his wife Holly, who have created, um, it's called, I call it the Martin Match, where they've put up some money and they've asked other board members, past board members, to also put up some money. And so you combine the Minnesota Power Foundation money with the Scott uh, and Holly Martin money and you, you have a youth in philanthropy program where there's a philanthropic board of young people that get together and they do the same thing that we do as a board. They look at grant applications. You can apply for up to $1,000 as long as it's youth led, whatever the project is. And they look through and some of them are written, some of them are, the applications are written in crayon. And so they're able to provide um, grants to different projects in their community, which is awesome. Thank you so much. This has been such a great conversation. Trent Janovich, thank you so much for sharing the work of the Northland Foundation uh, as its board chair, and thank you so much for your insights. Thank you, Mark. It's been a pleasure. Thanks.